A mere 65 years after the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, a mere 65 years, a man named Justin was born of Greek-speaking pagan parents in the province of Samaria, which was in Palestine. Justin was given an excellent education by his father, and he was eventually known during his life as Justin the Philosopher. He searched for truth his whole life, and he studied the philosophies, the Greek philosophers of Aristotle, Socrates, but it was only when he discovered the Christian faith that he finally felt that he had found the path to truth. And so he was baptized into the Christian faith at the age of 30, after which he preached and taught all over and finally made his way to Rome itself, which was the capital of the known world in those days. But in the mid-second century, the persecution of Christians became much, much more intense. And the persecution was generally no longer carried out by Jews who disagreed with these Christians, but this persecution was done throughout the Roman Empire by the Romans because they believed that these early Christians were atheists, if you can believe that. They were accused of atheism. Why? Because they wouldn't worship the gods of the Roman Empire. They were accused of being seditious because the Christians talked about the kingdom of Christ and the Romans believed that this kingdom was going to take over their kingdom of Rome. But the worst, the worst thing, rumor, innuendo, that caused the persecution of the early Christians was the Christians' belief that in the Eucharist, Jesus had given us his own body and blood to eat and to drink and said to us, whoever does not eat my body and drink my blood has no life in him. Jesus gave us this, and it led to all kinds of silly things. For instance, the early Christians were accused of being cannibals. You still hear that every once in a while by somebody that, oh, those Catholics are, are cannibals because they eat the body and blood of Christ. Good luck with that, fellas. They also, the rumors were out that at the Christian worship, that they would have infanticide, that they would put a baby on the altar and they would cover it with meat of an animal and then they would stab it and then drink the blood. All of these things were present. And Justin took it upon himself to react to those things, to try to explain those misconceptions away. He is what we call an apologist. An apologist in the Catholic Church, or apologetics, is the field by which we defend the faith, by which we explain the faith. And Justin was the first one to do that, just early in the second century AD. And we're still in possession, amazingly, of three of his writings. It's amazing that after all that time, we still have those writings in which he wrote to Roman emperors, he wrote to the Senate of Rome, he wrote to anybody who would listen to try to correct the misunderstandings which led to so much persecution of the early Christians. I believe that it is crucial to be aware of what Justin wrote especially on this feast of Corpus Christi. And here's why. One of the things 
that Justin wrote. He wrote it to the Emperor Antonius Pius in the year 155. Okay, that's 1869 years ago now. He wrote to that emperor trying to explain what the early Christians, and I make no distinction between Christians, Catholics, because there were only us in those days. It wasn't until much later, like the 1500s, that there came to be Protestant Christians and Catholics. There we were all our church. And so he, he wrote to this emperor explaining what these Christians do when they worship. They don't drink the blood of babies. They don't do any of that. And the reason I want to share this with you, this is in the catechism. His entire letter is number 1345 in the catechism of the Catholic Church. But the reason I want to share that with you today is because what he told this emperor that they did in the year 155 is exactly what we are doing this morning. No difference. Absolutely incredible. And so here's what, here's what uh, Justin wrote to the emperor. On the day we call the day of the sun, all who dwell in the city or county gather in the same place. And so here, all those from Sun City, Peoria, Surprise, and wherever else, if you got lost and made a, a wrong turn, came here to Our Lady of Lourdes on this day of the sun. And then he says, after they gather, the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read as much as time permits. We just did that. If you remember, every time we come to Eucharist on Sunday, we have three readings. The first one is from the memoirs of the prophets, the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, the memoirs of the apostles, the letters of Paul or others, and the gospel. We still do that every time we come to Eucharist. Then he says, this is Justin, when the reader has finished, he who presides over those gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful things. That is the homily or the sermon which you are so accustomed to sleeping through. <laughs> after we hear the memoirs of the apostles, after we hear the teachings of Jesus, then even in the year 155, the presider then would explain those and in the explanation encourage people to live according to the teachings of Christ. And then, Justin says, we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves and for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions and faithful to the commandments, so as to obtain eternal salvation. That's the point we're at now, because as soon as the homily is over, we'll say the creed, which didn't exist at the time of uh, Justin, because the creed only came into effect in the third, fourth centuries as the church defined these different beliefs. But right after that, Deacon Jim will read these universal prayers, or the prayers of the faithful, whatever you want to call them. That is exactly what they did in the year 155. And the words, when the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss. We still do that. We just pushed it a little further along. We have the sign of peace, the kiss of peace. Then he says, then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the brethren. This is that little thing when someone, I can see you back there who's gonna do it today, who bring forth the bread and the wine to me, who presides over the brethren, we still do the exact same thing. And then, it's me, he takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for a considerable time, he gives thanks, which in Greek is Eucharistion, 
that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. That is exactly what we still do. It's called the Eucharistic prayer. It starts with the preface and goes all the way through the Eucharistic prayer in which we sing the Holy Holy, we sing the mystery of faith, and we come all the way to the doxology when I'll sing uh, through him, with him, in him, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Father, forever and ever. That is this Eucharistic prayer. This is what the presider prays. And then he says, when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present give voice to the acclamation by saying, Amen. This is the great Amen. Or sometimes those of us in the trade call it the lame Amen. <laughs> because we do this and the congregation says, Amen. Then he concludes. Justin says, when he who presides has given thanks and all the peoples have responded, then those whom we call deacons, ta-da, <laughs> give to those present the Eucharisted bread, the bread that has become the body and blood of Christ. And then they take them to all who are absent the sick. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm just sentimental, but when I read this, and every time I read this, I thank God for letting me be part of this faith. Because what you and I do today is what the Christians did all the way back to the time of Christ. Other these churches come and go. You have these big mega churches, and they brag about thousands of members and they've got a band up on the stage. But that's not what Jesus started. That's not what the apostles did. They don't have the body and blood of Christ. We do. Ultimately, the power of Christ present in the Eucharist, in his body and blood, soul and divinity, led Justin to accept martyrdom under the, the emperor Marcus Aurelius in the year 165. He and five or six of his students were commanded to worship the gods of Rome. They refused. They said, we worship the one true God whose body and blood we receive every day. And so they were flogged and beheaded. And from that time on, Justin was no longer known as Justin the philosopher, he was called Justin Martyr. We celebrated his feast yesterday, June 1st. From the witness Justin gave us in his writings, we know that what we do here today at Our Lady of Lourdes in Sun City West is exactly what the church has done faithfully since the days of Christ himself. We are indeed gifted. I just hope we appreciate the gift that God has given us.